Okay, thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to welcome Kate Burton to our LAMB series. Kate is so busy as an actress, as a teacher, as a wife, as a mother. I'm just amazed she had time to, to pause and talk to us for an hour. But thank you, Kate, for making the time. And we're going to cover the waterfront with okay. your entire career and your entire life uh -oh. in about 60 minutes. <laughs> uh, but I want to start by asking you uh, about a current project you're working on that I'm absolutely fascinated with. You're playing Hillary Clinton. Uh, I want to know if you've met her. I want to know what your attitude toward her is and how you've been preparing for playing this extraordinary public figure. Well, um, I'm very honored to be playing Hillary Clinton. Uh, I feel like I've been destined to play her uh, probably the last 10 or 15 years. Um, I have played her once before, actually. I played her um, uh, in uh, the comedians uh, Key and uh, Keegan Michael Key and Jordan Peele's show, Keegan and, you know, uh, Key and Peele. And uh, in that show, um, I don't know if any of you have ever seen it. It was a very, very funny show. Uh, and they had a whole skit about Obama and his anger manager. And then they had Hillary come on with her anger manager. <laughs> it was very, very calm. We had a wonderful time. And then cut to um, last summer, I had uh, interviewed for The First Lady, which is on Showtime to play a part uh, in uh, Michelle Obama's segment as her kind of uh, mentor friend who then kind of traveled with her to the White House and did not get that part, which was okay. Uh, and then they said to me, but there is another role. And so they, uh, they and I thought, oh, what could that be? And then out of the blue uh, came along Miss Ms. Hillary Rodham Clinton. And I just looked in the mirror and went, okay, yep. And so it was, a, it was it mostly it's a kind of a wonderful one scene. It's in, I think the seventh episode of the series, which is currently on Showtime. Wonderful show, amazing performances by all three leading actresses. Um, and I came on in, uh, in the period of time where Hillary's running for president and Michelle and she have always a little bit been at odds with each other. And Michelle is now making her first foray and her first stump speech for Hillary. And they have, we have a scene together where we kind of talk through our, our differences and we both end up um, on, you know, obviously we've always been on the same side, but that they, we end up having kind of a rapprochement and it's a beautiful scene. It's told through the eyes of Michelle Obama, which is so interesting. And um, so it was, it was fascinating, you know, just having a little, it's literally like just a little slice of Hillary and mostly um, it was really remarkable was when I did the hair and makeup and uh, put on the costume, the blue suit and the pearls and the, you know, I had, a, I mean, my hair is actually right now a lot like hers, but um, then it wasn't. And so they kind of created this, this incredible, and she's got an incredible head of hair. And um, anyway, it was unbelievable. I mean, when I looked in the mirror the first time and I don't have my cell phone with me or I would have shown you the image. Um, it was really, I, I, we all like were gobsmacked and I've sent it to a lot of my friends and they're like, I can't believe, you know, so anyway, so she makes her appearance uh, soon <clears throat> and it was, <clears throat> it was great. I was in Atlanta, Georgia and it was a labor of love. Um, I was there doing another show there, which has not come out yet. <clears throat> and I had visited um, where FDR passed away uh, where he had, you know, his incredible pools and that he would swim in for his polio. And, um, and it was Warm Springs, Georgia. And I learned my lines to play Hillary Clinton sitting in Warm Springs, Georgia. And it really just meant so much to me. But I, I have had the great um, honor of meeting her a few times. Um, she's a great lover of the theater, as I think. I know that, yes. She loves the theater. And, and so I've seen, I've met her backstage. I've met her backstage at Lincoln Center. I've met her backstage at the New York Philharmonic. Um, and, uh, you know, always but been a huge I, fan. I supported her I'm entirely, <laughs> gave her all the money in my bank account. Um, and, you know, we know how that turned out. I'm but, assuming, you know, Kate, if the portrait had not been sympathetic, 
you wouldn't have taken the role. You, you know what? What, it, what, you know, what, I, what is kind of great about the portrait is it's quite re, it's quite real. You know what I mean? It's um, it's an interesting thing. As I say, it's through the eyes of Michelle Obama, but it's but it but it's like a real person. It's not just some cardboard, you know, cutout because so often, you know, when you're playing, I I played a few real people in my life, but not somebody who's quite so well known as she is. <laughs> so it was, you know, and I kind of have a little flavor of her uh, Illinois twang and you know I'm from New York myself but uh <laughs> so it was it was it was a great experience it was a uh, incredible director um um on the show and uh, a Danish director who um directed uh the night manager and directed the undoing and um and she's just incredible so that was really great and of course I was working with Viola Davis so it doesn't get better than that you know, and she is someone I've always known as a great friend. And it was a powerhouse day. I kind of, it took me two days to recover from, from the experience, but you know, there was Viola and she's, you know, one of our greatest actresses. So it was really I'm, I'm assuming incredible you, experience. I'm assuming you haven't had a note from Hillary. No, 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 word. no, I, I don't, I, I don't, wonder. I don't know. I mean, I'm imagining she may watch this show because I know she loves you know, she loves theater and television. She, I'm sure she's met Viola quite a few times. Um, but um, yeah, no, I don't think I don't think I'll be getting any notes. But uh, okay. yeah, but uh, but I'm I'm you know she, what a brilliant president she would have made. Oh my god! But you you approach her with enormous respect and love. You think you, huge. It was, it was very the, the hilarious thing is, is when you you've been on a film set. You know, oftentimes. Um, you know, whatever you're, you know, they, they, you're like two, you know, two, two rooms away and then you're in there kind of getting ready and they say, okay, you know, we need you on the set. And then as I was walking from that room and we were backstage at a um, arena because that's what I'm at, I'm at, I'm delivering a speech at a convention. And as I was walking along, you know, looking sort of exactly in my blue suit uh, and my blonde hair, uh, I, I heard, okay, Hillary's walking. <laughs> I just kept like bursting out laughing like kids I'm you know I'm actually Kate you know I'm, I'm pretending to be Hillary but it was great because you know I was only really there for the one day to shoot and we had one big scene and then two small little poppy scenes the first scene where I meet Michelle is is like out of this world um uh just a fantastic uh scene and you know so it was um it was just it was it was great and uh as I say, it took me two two full days in Atlanta, Georgia, to calm down. <laughs> now, now here's a here's a very good segue. Speaking of world famous people, yes, you grew up <laughs> with a father and mm -hmm. stepmother who, at the time, were probably the most famous people on the planet. Correct. And you were a little girl, five, six, seven, in all these photographs with all this attention on these two magnificent adults. Did that influence your attitude about fame and celebrity? Did you want that for yourself? Did you want to avoid that for yourself? What impact did it have on you? Uh, well, I grew up with that, um, you know, and fa funnily enough, I was chatting with a friend today who was saying something like, oh, you know, I said, you know, when you grow up with a, with a family member, or in my case, two family members who are so extraordinarily well known, you know, how does that affect you as a child? And you know what? I have nothing else to compare it to. The only thing, mercifully, my parents actually split up because they both married incredible people. And my mother and my, my mother, who was incredible Sybil, Sybil Williams Burton Christopher, um, she married my wonderful stepfather, Jordan Christopher, who really was the person who brought me up. Uh, the two of them brought me up and I had a extremely happy rambunctious childhood in New York City in the 60s and 70s I went to the United Nations International School downtown I you know traveled on the subway to I mean you know had the classic sort of New York Ed Koch was mayor you know Mayor Lindsay it was a great great time and so I had a very stable upbringing so I was very very lucky because two of my four parental units gave me tremendous stability. So as a result, I could enjoy the aspect of dad and Elizabeth, which was always such a hoot and know that it was a hoot from a very early age and know 
that I had no desire whatsoever to have that as my life. Um, and also it was interesting because I was the first person in my family to finish college. And so I knew that when I went to college, I wanted to be an academic student. I mean, I wanted to not study theater. I did a little bit of theater as a fruit through extracurricular. So, you know, it wasn't until I was a senior in college at the ripe old age of 21, where I decided to even pursue acting. Acting was not on my radar. In fact, the actresses that I grew up with were Elizabeth Taylor, Tammy Grimes, Rachel Roberts, Lauren Bacall. These were my mother's best friends. And so I had this larger than life gallery of incredibly famous, persnickety, hilarious, magnificent actresses who I grew up with. And I thought, oh, I'm not like them. Look at me, I'm sitting here in my house in LA with my little blue shirt and my glasses. You know, I wasn't like a glamor puss. You know, I was, I've never been one. And I think that for me, just like with any child growing up with quote unquote celebrity parents, first of all, they're your parents, you know, that you don't know anything else. And I know that my own journey to becoming an actor was my own journey. And it was, you know, and I always say this to kids who are, children of, of particularly famous actors and, I'm, and they're talking to me about becoming actors and I'm like, it's great, but it has to be your journey. It's not their journey. It's your journey. And of course I've had a very- Turn this thing down here. Yep, where's my audio? I, Jesus Christ, where is it? Uh, recording, no. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we good? Uh, no, just, okay. and just my uh, saying yeah, is yeah. that, you know, <laughs> I have had a different kind of career than any of my, my, my parental units who were actors. And I think everybody has their own path. You know what I mean? It's, it's your but, own path. So but, anyway. But, but, but Kate, people in, in your position exposed to that amount of fame and glamor and attention could have been spoiled or could have gone bad. You've had a very stable, very grounded life. You're a grounded, we can see that in a minute. Shocking. You're a grounded yeah. person. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I am you, grounded. You could have gone in a different direction. Could have gone haywire. You I think have. I was pretty doubtful. I mean, I made the greatest decision of my life um, five days before I graduated from the Yale School of Drama. I met a stage manager who would become my husband, Michael Ritchie. And I think that when we got together, I was, I was very clear, like, oh, this is my life partner. And there's no question about it. And so I've been so blessed to have this man in my life and my life partner. And, uh, you know, we've, we've been together. I graduated from Yale 40 years ago, almost to the, I mean, about in about two or three weeks, it'll be to the day. And that's when I met him 40 years ago. So and that that helped too. That but, really helped. But and your he, father must have been a good father in his own way. In his own way, <laughs> <laughs> you know. I mean, look, he was look. There was nobody like Richard Burton. Let's be honest. Uh, you know, I mean, he's been gone for thirty-seven years now. It's extraordinary, and isn't it amazing? that we are talking about him. Isn't it amazing that that he's, his legacy as the amazing actor, the extraordinary theater actor, film actor, um, audio actor. Um, and it's, it's, it's remarkable to me. Having said that, it is usually in this country, in the United States, uh, the uh, exception that people, uh, certainly below the age of 45, many, many do not know who my father is, which shocks me because getting back to your point, having grown up with this extraordinarily famous dad, that it, it blew my mind. It happened about 15 years ago for the first time where I went, oh my God, they don't know who my dad is. And I was like, how interesting that is. And then, but in Britain, it's my other country where I'm from, the U UK, it's completely different. Everybody knows who my father is. Everybody who's so, different. Yeah, and even, you know, ch kids, you know, teenagers, they'll all know, they'll all go, oh my God. You know, uh, <laughs> Saoirse Ronan, I remember yeah. meeting her, Saoirse Ronan, after I saw The Crucible on Broadway and I introduced myself and I said, Saoirse, 
I said, you know, um, my name is Kate Burton and, um, and, uh, and we had some mutual friends. We had some mutual friends in the cast and then I had some Irish friends uh, that knew her quite well because I'd spent time in Ireland doing plays. And, uh, and she, here she was, what was she like 22 or something at the time? And she went, ah, you know, are you Richard Burton's daughter? And I was like, yes, yes I am. And I'm amazed that you just said that to me. It's shocking. So there you go. You've said on a number of occasions that Elizabeth Taylor was very welcoming to you. Wonderful. It was quite wonderful, actually. She was. You know, Elizabeth never met a stranger. <laughs> um, Elizabeth treated me, I mean, I couldn't have asked for a better stepmother. Um, I was blessed because my two step parents were extraordinary growing up. My stepfather, Jordan, such a huge part of my life. Uh, and Elizabeth always made me feel very welcome and like I belong, I met, was meant to be there. Um, you know, when I came to visit, I would only come for little pockets of time in the summertime. Sometimes I would, dad would sweep through New York and I would see him. Um, but it, it was fine. You know, I didn't, it was about quality, not quantity. And, you know, dad was an excellent dad in that way. Like, you know, I'm there for three weeks. And of course, you know, those summer vacations were pretty darn fun. And I knew it. You know, I knew, you know, dad's playing Henry VIII in Out of a Thousand Days. Okay, so now I'm going to England and we're gonna be sitting on some set in front of Bolin Castle and I'm 11 years old and, you know, dad says, do you wanna be in the movie? And I'm like, sure, you know, I had no intention of being an actor at that point. So you, you know, you have 11 year old Kate Burton playing a Bolin maid, you know, in Out of a Thousand Days. And mostly I was thrilled out of my mind because I was obsessed with the Tudors, obsessed with Elizabeth I, obsessed with Anne Boleyn, obsessed with, you know, all of, all of that. And so there I was in the actual place and I knew how lucky I was. I was able to enjoy the context of it. Um, my very first time on a film set, was when I was eight years old um, in Hollywood, Hollywood, where I am right now. And uh, it was Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? And Mike Nichols, you know, there he was, who was a friend of all my parents. Um, and uh, the first time I met Elizabeth properly, she was dressed as, uh, you know, Martha. So, oh. you know, and I, she didn't look like herself, you know, and I was like, wow, this lady, I don't know, she seems kind of old. So <laughs> she was actually, what, 27 or something? But do you, um, do you yeah, consider incredible. yourself at all uh, a student of your father's work? You've seen most of it, I, I assume. I've seen most of it. I haven't oh. seen all of it. I've kept a few things as treasures uh, to watch at some future date, believe it or not. Um, I've seen, uh, I've seen, I would say, probably four fifths of his work obviously on film. I did see him in two plays. One was Equus and one was uh, Camelot, the musical, the, the revival. And that was kind of incredible. Um, you know, my dad um, did not have formal training as an actor. He had an incredible mentor um, and he had two incredible mentors. He had Philip Burton, P.H. Burton, who was my father's adopted father who is actually I call him my grandfather but he was actually not a blood relative and his name was Burton and that's how dad became Burton because dad grew up as Richard Jenkins and um and then his other great mentor initially was Emlyn Williams the great Welsh playwright and actor and director and in fact it was because of Emlyn Williams making a, a small film called The Last Days of Dalwyn a Welsh, a Welsh movie through and through that my mother, Sybil Williams, who had just graduated from Lambda in London, who did have training, she was in the movie as one of the extras and dad was the young male lead. And that's how they met, was on that movie. So it was Emlyn Williams, who is my godfather, who brought them together. So, you know, those were dad's great mentors. And in terms of my studying his work, I think, one of the things that I, I was always struck by, because I did get to see, there is that one, that very um, seminal recording of his Hamlet in 1964. And I have seen that. And as a child, <laughs> I remember seeing that and going, wow, you know, this is theater acting on film and it's different, you know? Um, um, 
so I was able to see dad both on the stage. I wish I had seen him in his younger years, but of course I wasn't born yet. Um, and, uh, and so I've studied him as a classical actor, knowing what I know about his approach and also because of all the audio work and because I've done a ton of classical roles, Shakespeare, um, and then obviously Chekhov and Ibsen, but that's, you know, later on, um, uh, dad's work with Shakespeare, his affinity for Shakespeare is something that I've really, um, spent a lot of time studying. I think that's the thing I've studied the most is he was dad's a, he was relationship to Shakespeare. He was an extraordinary classical actor, which people who know his fame might not appreciate. He made popular American films, yep. but he did classical roles with oh, great yeah. distinction. And of course, with that, with that extraordinary voice that he that had. That extraordinary voice. Wasn't there, wasn't there a tension in his life though between the great celebrity and the attention to being a good actor. Yes. The two could, con could contradict each other and get in each other's way. They did, they did. They I mean, did. The truth of it is that, you know, he was considered the heir. He and Paul Schofield were considered the heirs to Gilgood Richardson and Olivier. They were all a bit, dad and Paul were around the same age, I think, um, I think. Um, and um, and the, the, the other three gents, uh, were a bit older and, you know, Gilgood was a huge part of his life because Gilgood directed him a number of times and Gilgood directed his Hamlet and they were always in touch. Um, but that whole notion that they were the great British actors, the English actors, British actors, and that dad had somehow absconded, you know, with his great uh, classical theatrical ability and gone to Hollywood. Um, but, you know, the truth of it is dad did not, I think dad ran the gamut in terms of classical work um, and the occasional extraordinary new work, but very rarely new work. Um, and it's ironic that, you know, one of his greatest roles, and for me, this was the role that I went, oh my God, okay, I get it. Uh, which was Jimmy Porter and Look Back in Anger, the movie directed by Tony Richardson, Natasha's dad, that, um, you know, that was thrilling because dad hadn't played those kinds of roles on stage. Um, he didn't work at the Royal Court. He worked at the Royal Shakespeare Company. He worked at the Old Vic where they did classical work. So it was interesting that his newer stuff was on film. Um, but the juxtaposition of, of, of classical theater and Hollywood you know, and the kinds of movies he did. I mean, he did some great movies, but he also did some terrible movies. So, yeah, you know, yeah. but, but you <laughs> know, he tell you his, it himself. Yeah. His, his greatest moment on screen, correct me if I'm wrong, is Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? Yeah, I really think that's pretty great. I mean, his, he played very far outside of himself. Um, and, you know, they, because they were newly married, I mean, they were not, they had been not married that long. They, um, they used a lot of their own relationship, uh, which was a little shocking for the children uh, watching the movie. I mean, I really didn't see that movie until I was in college. They're both um, terrific. I mean, Elizabeth was a wonderful film actress. Oh my God, she was amazing. And I think the she camera actually, loved her. the camera loved her. She the was camera loved her and she was good. Yeah. In the right part, you know, she was the, good. When you see her as a young actress, that's what's mind blowing. When you see her in Father of the Bride, when you see her in- Place in the um, Sun. Oh, Place in the Sun. Place in the Sun. I mean, Mike Nichols referred to that movie as one of the most perfect films ever. In fact, he re regarded it as his, his favorite film. And A Place in the Sun, her performance in that is extraordinary. When you think how young, it was extraordinary no matter what age she was, but yes. to think how young. And because, you know, funnily enough, even though I consider myself a child of the theater, I grew up on film sets because with dad and Elizabeth, I was on film sets all the time. And it's so funny, I didn't connect the dots until I was on various film sets. M most of my work on camera has been TV and has been, you know, I've been blessed to have played amazing roles in television. And I'm very grateful to many people, particularly to Shonda Rhimes, we're, we're gonna um, get you know, and that's the thing is that I, I realized, oh, I have, it took me a while to realize, oh my God, I'm so comfortable in this medium. Like, why am I so comfortable? Cause I'm such a theater girl. 
And then I went, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I grew up with these, these film actors. Oh yeah, I remember them. So, you know, it again, it's my own journey. So it's, it, is, it is reflective of my family, but it is also, you know, it's been definitely my own, my own path. But isn't it wonderful that you had this exposure to this fame and celebrity and attention and you have no bitterness about it, you accept None, it. zero. But you even, you find some joy in it actually. Total joy. The memory no, of No, and because I also grew up with, you know, there's a whole gang of us who grew up on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. A few on the East Side, I'll just yeah. say, but mostly on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And it was, you know, Lauren Bacall and Leonard Bernstein's kids who grew up in the Dakota. And, you know, I grew up in the El Dorado and, you know, Adolph and Phyllis's kids uh, grew up in, uh, and Sidney Lumet's kids grew up in uh, the Beresford, and then there was the Ansonia and the Apthorpe, you know, so we have all these sort of iconic buildings all over the Upper West Side, and we all kind of grew up, and we were thrown together as kids in our family, because our families, our parents loved each other, adored spending time together, and so cutely invited us along so often. And so I really grew up with knowing all these people, not as Lauren Bacall, but actually Betty Bacall, Betty in her kitchen complaining about something. And, you know, uh, always complaining, always, always full of, I mean, funniest, one of the funniest humans on earth. And, um, you know, and this was one of my mother's best friends, you know, so this is, you know, and I'm still close to her kids. And we all as children have started to talk to each other about kind of creating an oral history together because we realize that our stories are, you know, they're, they're interesting stories and they are, they're, they're fascinating they're stories. But I wanna ask you, has anybody ever approached you about writing a book, a memoir? You know, yes, is the answer. And what and have you said? The, the only, I have said, well, sure, that sounds great, but when will I do it? <laughs> it actually <laughs> requires pen yes, and, yes, and, and time. Pen. And time. And uh, one of the things but, is I'm, I'm but it's something you would consider. Oh, yes. Uh, yes, what? I would consider it. And uh, I, I actually have a very dear friend who would love to uh, represent me uh, in this endeavor. Um, I'm trying to figure out the best way. I had um, a kind of uh, great sort of moment where when um, Elizabeth Taylor's four children, who are my three step step siblings and one half sister, and when Elizabeth passed away 11 years ago, they asked me to speak for them because they're not comfortable standing on stage. They were like, will you do it? And will you stand and speak for us? So I did. And what I did was, is I kind of, sort of like a little bit, you know, what we've done today is that I've just talked to, I said, these are snapshots of our childhood, just for you to have an idea of what it is to grow up with such these such such parents as these, and um, so I kind of did it in a very um, not you know linear narrative way, but in a, in a kind of and then this and then you know now we're in 1965 in in London and we're in a yacht on the Thames because the dogs are not allowed to come ashore, so for some reason we're all in a boat, you know, and like who does that? Oh, Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton. So <laughs> you know, um, and you know, I kind of knew it was a hoot at the time, but so we do, I kind of told them, and I think, oh, that's the way to do it. The other thing too, is I kept a diary, um, which my daughter who's 24 came across when in all her children's books. And I kept it sort of in the late sixties for about two years. And it was a period of time where I was in, my mother and my stepfather and I moved to Los Angeles. And it was an incredible time to be in LA 1967 through 69. And a lot happened in that time, including the lunar landing, the Manson murders, and we were there and literally participants like Roman Polanski were like right next door. So, you know, uh, it was just kind of an incredible kind of time capsule thing. And that's what I'm thinking about as a time capsule. And then, you know, my mother, my amazing mother who reinvented her life so many times. Amazingly, I mean, she, right? She was Disco. extraordinary. I mean, she started Arthur, as an Disco. actress, meets my father. My mother's story has been told in a very kind of distant way by a few people, but never really told. So there's a way that I would love to be able to tell mom's story, you know, in a way that she would be happy with. 
um, and not feel violated in any way, but also it's an extraordinary story because she and my father split up. She moves to New York with her two little daughters. She sets up residency at the El Dorado and she decides as all mothers do to open a nightclub. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> so, you know, my mother opens Arthur, which from 64 to 68 was the place. To world be famous. World, world famous. famous. And she only, you know, and that's my mother's creative genius is that she was, she was a casting director for a, for a guy who was running the new theater, which was a little theater on 54th street, right across from El Morocco, which is now where the city core building is. And um, basically she's looking at the space and she's thinking, oh, this would be good for a nightclub. I mean, who thinks like that? <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't have those thoughts. So, you know, she and Roddy McDowell and uh, Edward Villela from the New York City Ballet, they decide to create a partnership and open this incredible night, nightclub called Arthur. And it was the place to hang out in the sixties. And she ended it on, she said, I want to go out in a blaze of glory. So she, and that's where she met my stepmother who was the singer in the band. Oh my God. You can't make this stuff up. I mean, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> and what about Bay Street? And Bay Street. And you know, that's another thing. In between my mother moves to Los Angeles for 10 years. Um, becomes a literary agent at ICM. This is a woman who didn't finish high school, <laughs> um, but amazingly brilliantly well-read. And then when my son is born, who's 34 this, this Saturday, when my son is born, she goes, okay, that's it. And she moves back East. She leaves LA, moves back East. And then two years later is sitting on the wharf in Sag Harbor and goes, that would be a that roller rink would be a great theater um, and it's still and it's still going it's still going after, you know 20 30 years almost it's unbelievable yeah. and she, people I mean, she who, was unbelievable people who know her talk to me about her larger than life personality <laughs> vivacity i mean she was a she was a great figure she, she was a great, a great figure, figure and she loved and here's the great news she loved she she bloomed where she was planted always and she, um, she had this ability to make, you know, lemonade out of lemons, you know, I mean, she totally did it. And she loved her work. I mean, running Bay Street, founding Bay Street with Emma Walton and Stephen Hamilton was, she loved it. She loved it. She loved the theater. She loved the writers. She loved the actors. You know, she loved the she loved living. She, she really living. did. She really loved her life. She loved her yeah. life. She really, really did. Yeah. I mean, she's a, it's wonderful? a great lesson to, yeah. to many that, of us, you know. How I, want, I want to ask you about your own uh, background. You went to Brown, which was I a did. tough school to get into. You must have been a very good student. I was Studious a very hardworking hard student. You were a hardworking student. Hardworking student. And, and, you know. Was education important to you or yes. your parents? Where did it come from? Did it come from it, it was important Did your to parents me. say you was, go to college it was my it was my father I knew that my father always felt bereft to a certain degree that he didn't finish his college education but you know during World War II which is when he went they had these short courses at Oxford and Cambridge and that's what he did he did a I didn't know that until way later after he died he'd done a short course it was just six months but that's where he met um so many of the people that he would work with for the rest of his life. For me, I knew that I wanted to have a full college education. To be honest, I went to the United Nations International School and I thought I was going to be a diplomat because I was studying French and Russian and history. I'd grown up speaking French because I was born in French, Switzerland. And um, so I don't speak it fluently, but I'm very comfortable speaking it. And then I started learning Russian was fascinated by Russian history. So that's where I went to Brown as a Russian studies major. And that's what I graduated as. And it was the summer before my senior year at Brown. And I had always done, you know, theater as a side, you know, um, extracurricular activity. And I had two fantastic acting teachers at Brown. And, um, and it was the summer before my senior year and I was visiting some friends in Berkeley, California. And I decided to go to UC Cal, to UC Berkeley, to look at their college of uh, their, uh, their um, graduate degree in Slavic studies. And I was there and, a friend, and I was staying with a friend who was working at the summer, sorry if I'm going a little wonky on you here, 
told me my, my internet connection's a little funky. Anyway, and she took me to her acting class at ACT. And I was staying with, um, her, her name's Nancy Carlin. She's still a dear friend. Her mother, Joy Carlin, was one of the founders of ACT, a great friend of Mike Nichols. They had known each other in, when they were at uh, University of Chicago. And I just was with this incredible artistic family and I visited and I thought, oh, okay, I need to think about this. And I said to my father, it was the only fight we ever had. I went to visit him uh, in Mexico, in Puerto Vallarta. And I said, hey dad, so here's the thing. I know, don't panic, but I am going to apply to, to drama school. And if I don't get in, that will be all I need to hear. You know, you didn't get in, you're done. And I would have just, you know, gotten a job for a minute and then gone to graduate school in, in diplomacy in you know, foreign service. And so he was horrified, oh, God, you know, and he said, you know, why, why, you know? <laughs> and I said, well, dad, it's just something, if I don't give it a try, I might always regret it. So let me give it a try. And I promise you that if by the time I'm 30, which felt <laughs> like 152, when 30, if by the time I'm 30, um, I haven't had success, I will do something else. I promise you, I will do something else. Don't panic. But what was his terror about? Because he thought he it was a dangerous the idea. He, It's just, he hated the idea of the persnickety, and then I don't blame him, uh, the persnickety-ness of the profession. I mean, both my kids, you know, my son actually initially wanted to be an actor. He's a beautiful actor. But uh, he decided about after about five years, he went, you know, I really love writing just as much. I'm going to focus on writing. And my mother's reaction was, oh, thank God. You know, I mean, you know, me, well, she was surrounded by actors. But um, no, I think for him, it was just, you know, you just don't know what's going to happen. You know, you don't know. You don't have a steady job. Sometimes you work all the time. Sometimes you don't work at all. And, you know, I would say, um, you know, for me, part one was getting into drama school. And I applied to two, two drama schools in the United States, three drama schools in the United States, one in England. And that became, actually our fight was not about me going to drama school as would I, why won't I go to the British one? He was pissed. And he said, well, will you know how to speak? And I said, well, dad, I said, you know, I speak with an American accent. I don't know if you've noticed. He goes, you're a Yank. How did that happen? I said, well, I grew up in New York City. That's how that happened. So, <laughs> so I mean, it was just sort of hilarious. And I said, dad, look, you know, I, let's see where I get in. I may not get in anywhere. We'll see what happens. Anyway, fortunately I got in to two out of the three American ones. So I chose between Yale, ACT, and then the Central School of Speech and Drama in London. And that was the fight. Actually he said, you must go to Central. And I said, oh, oh no, no, I'm gonna stay in the United States. And, and I think if, Yale, it, when I got into Yale, I was like, that's it, you know, I'm going to Yale. So, yeah. and I knew Yale was Yale and I knew of its reputation and I thought this was perfect and it was perfect for me. It was a perfect school for me. And did, were you a hard worker there as well? Yes. I mean, I think I had an interest, I, <laughs> yes, I was a hard worker, although one of my professors might not have agreed with you, but um, one of my professors said to me, Kate, you, you're very comfortable in the pack, but you, but you need to push yourself to go beyond the pack. And I remember standing there going, but I like the pack. <laughs> like, I, it's like, if you say to me, do you, would you rather do a one woman show or an ensemble show? I will always say ensemble. That's what it's, that's the glory of being an actor is the ensemble experience, which is why I love Chekhov so much. Um, so that was, yeah, so that was interesting. And basically I, but I did, but I realized that it sort of happened. I was blessed to go in my class at Yale class of 1982, um, was, I also had two nifty little actresses who are two of my closest friends. One is Jane Kaczmarek, who, um, who's been in tons and tons of stuff, but, uh, had her greatest sort of fame as the mother in Malcolm in the Middle for seven years, seven Emmy nominations by the way, in a row, pretty amazing. She's still one of my closest friends. Our daughters are best friends. And then the other nifty actress in my class was one Frances McDormand. So, oh. you know, who was, you know, and the three of us came out together and we all kind of, 
theater, television, film, we all kind of made our way. And then we all kind of had our moment where we really started to, you know, sort of become well-known, which was in our late thirties, early forties, which is sort of a perfect moment for that to happen when you're old enough and you say, isn't this great? I'm Hedda Gabler on Broadway. What a, what a concept, you know, oh, look, I got my first Tony nomination. You know what at, I mean? It's just- at drama, Kate, at drama school, were you treated in a special way? Because at that time, of course- My father is very famous. Your father was enormously famous and as was Elizabeth um, Taylor. Were, did, were people intimidated by you? Were you aware of that? <laughs> were they afraid of you? No. Were, did they feel they have to go very carefully with you? No. Uh, no. uh, it was honestly, I never, somebody said to me once, oh, well, it's going to be different for you because, you know, blah, blah, blah. And you know what? I didn't take, I wasn't insulted by that. I was like, yeah, there probably will be some things that will come my way because of who my, my family is, my father is. But, you know, what, what I always say to anybody from, who comes from a, you know, a celebrity parent I say, you're going to get your foot in the door, perhaps a little bit more easily, but keeping your foot in the door is going to be challenging because I have seen where you, somebody comes out of, somebody does their first thing, it's not successful, discarded. And what happened to me is that I was very blessed because the first three plays I did were um, Present Laughter with George C. Scott, Alice in Wonderland with Eva Le Gallienne, directed directed by both of them. And then this incredible little Irish play called Winners at the Susan Block Theater on 26th Street underneath the grocery store. And those three plays, one after the other, were, I got something incredibly, it was a great, each one was a gift because it gave me, I was in, a, it was a huge hit, Present Laughter. I played the little girl, starts the show. I had all my scenes with George. I mean, what is better than that? You know, George C. Scott, Dana Ivey, Nathan Lane, hello. I mean, all my dearest friends. And then my second show was directed by Eva Le Gallien, who was a theatrical legend. And it was a big bomb. <laughs> it was a but, huge bomb. But Alice in Wonderland never works, is it? Never works. I mean, you can't because never works. Well, because she was looking at the Tenniel drawings and we were like cardboard characters, except for me. I was the only person who was like, had a, you know, pink face. Everybody else was a little mascot. Big fat bomb, huge bomb. And then my third show, after I'd recovered from that, was this little teeny tiny Irish one act by Brian Friel, one of the greatest writers. So I had Noel Coward, Brian Friel, Lewis Carroll, all in the same, all in the e England or Ireland. And it was, but, it was an incredible way to begin because it gave me an incredible taste. But you got oh. present laughter very soon after Yale. You didn't have to wait for your shot. It came to you very quickly after you graduated. Is that right? I graduated. I, I got the job five days before graduation. Oh. I graduated <laughs> on Monday and I went to Broadway on Tuesday. Oh and my goodness. I knew, Foster, I knew how lucky I was. I yeah. knew that that was incredible. I, I, I didn't take advantage, uh, uh, you know, and then, and who did, little did I know I was meeting also my future husband, by the way. But then something extraordinary happened to you and it's happened to only three performers in the same season. You're nominated for Best Actress for Hedda Gabler and Best Supporting for The Elephant Man. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Well, actually it's, I think it's five now because it was it's a man five now. Dana Ivey, both dear friends. Uh, me and then Amanda Plummer. Amanda Plummer, yeah, she was the first one, I think, with Agnes of God, and then I forget what the other was. It uh, My Fair Lady, maybe, or no, uh, Pygmalion. I'm not sure. Anyway, oh. yeah, and then I know the last one was uh, Jeremy Pope from uh, Ain't Too Proud, and uh, but the, you're still a very select group. We're a select group. Very select group. We're a select group. Select group. And then you went on to do musicals and so many things on Broadway. Yeah, I did musicals. No, nice... the musicals were thrilling. I mean, the most thrilling of all was um, Company. Company. It's on time. And Scott Ellis, Tony Walton did the set, my beloved Tony Walton. Um, Are and... you a trained singer? I'm not a trained singer, but I'm Welsh. So Welsh people have a natural <laughs> affinity. <laughs> um, so I've always been a natural singer. I feel I'm very comfortable singing. I've always 
when I'm in a musical, I will work with a singing teacher and really work on it very technically, but it's something I love. I don't get to do it all the time, but I do love it. Yeah, I do love it all. And I just did a musical, a musical play, which was a Christmas Carol, the one that had been done on Broadway with Campbell Scott. And I played Andrea Martin's part uh, in Los Angeles and Las Vegas, which was fascinating. Oh, oh wonderful. That's a whole other story. But your Broadway career so far has a certain wonderful bookend quality. You start with present laughter and 35 years later, and I believe your last Broadway credit till now. Yes, present, present laughter. laughter again. You, with Mr. you graduated with Mr. to an older boy. Miss Kevin oh, Klein. I mean, Mr. Kevin Klein. Let's let's just take a moment. I mean, that I mean to, to have played in that play with George C. Scott and Kevin Klein. I mean, honestly, if that is the last Broadway show I do, it's all good. I feel very blessed. Don't you uh, think you'll come back to Broadway though? You I would love it. Yeah, I mean, I'm planning to um, at some point later on. Uh, we're planning to base our. We've been based in L.A for 17 years because my husband ran the Center Theater Group, yes, of Anderson course. Taper, Douglas, and he just retired. So we're now gonna shift our base to New York and then I'll be spending time out here bouncing back, you know, I'll be bouncing back and forth, but New York will be our main base. Yes, so you, you, will, you will certainly come back to Broadway. Hopefully, or I'll Definitely. come back somewhere where there's a theater. <laughs> sure, now what I'm fascinated uh, to hear about, so I'm a teacher myself, is you are a full professor at USC. Yes, in my spare time. How did that time. happen? In and my spare you, time. Are you, are you a good teacher? <laughs> you know, I've become a good teacher. I've become a good teacher. At first, I don't think I truly knew what the heck I was doing. And I, I started it right after Present Laughter with Kevin Klein. And, um, and now I think I, I, my specialties, what are my specialties? The things I teach the most, I teach Shakespeare. I teach Shakespeare for the now... Um, the whole year. And then I direct a Shakespeare play every year, which is great with the MFAs. And then I teach camera acting to many different cohorts. And then recently I've just taught a small class on Chekhov, which I always used to teach, but then Chekhov got taken out of the curriculum, but my students actually asked for it. So I just, today we did a little little second act of Three Sisters uh, for the for How the interesting, class. Shakespeare depends so much on language. And yeah. Chekhov, there's so few words and it's all subtext. It must be a very different approach to I think, keep acting I think, with those two writers. Yeah, I think they both are fantastic um, uh, groups of texts to teach acting, which is why they're used so often. Shakespeare will always be used, I think. Chekhov, it's gonna be sort of a little minute, I think before, I mean, when I went to Yale, my first year at Yale was Chekhov, Ibsen, Strindberg. It, that was it. That's what we worked on the whole year. And, um, you know, that set me up. But the irony is, is that I love Chekhov, 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 Chekhov. I was a Russian studies major. I could read him in the original because it's very simple language. I hated Ibsen. I hated him so much. And I just, every time they asked me to do a scene from Ibsen, I'm like, no, no. So when, you know, twin, you know, whatever, 16 years later, when my mother, I'm just total nepotism, when my mother and my husband, who was running Williamstown Theater Festival at the time, asked me, did I want to play Hedda Gabler? I was like, oh no, oh God, no. You know, and little did I know that it would sort of change my life a little bit. Well, you're an acting teacher at the USC. That's what you're doing. You yeah. act, but but I get but I gather you do give a lot of literary and historical context in your classes. I your do, life. I do in my particular, well, in both my Shakespeare and my um, Chekhov classes, but Shakespeare for sure. I try to, um, you know, note, I, I try to always set it in the context of who was the monarch on the throne. There is a distinct difference between the Elizabethan plays and the Jacobean plays. And, you know, to be honest, until I started teaching, I didn't really know that. I'd been in tons of Shakespeare plays and I had no idea. I was like, yeah, whatever, it's fine. Who's the kid, who cares? You know, so I feel like I've learned a ton being a professor. I feel like I've learned because I wish my teachers had, had given me Will in the World by Stephen Greenblatt, given me all of James Shapiro's amazing books. Um, you know, and the reason I got to know James Shapiro who's at Columbia is because he's the dramaturg at the New York Shakespeare Festival. And so when I did Coriolanus, which was the last play I did in New York, um, Coriolanus, and then before that I'd done Cymbeline, 
in the park. In the park, both in the park. And they were incredible experiences, both of them. And a lot of it I realized was due to not only Dan Sullivan, one of the great directors of all time, but also James Shapiro, our great dramaturg. So you know, you've become a Shakespeare scholar in effect. You know, that is so, I, you know, it, it honestly, he, I mean, I never get tired of it. So that I think that I feel like I'm, I've been helpful in my, you know, what I, and, and, and ironically in the five years that I've been at USC, I've played Volumnia and Coriolanus, Prospera and the Tempest and uh, Belarius in, um, in Cymbeline and the Queen. So I feel like I have, I can on, I don't, I would never say I'm a Shakespeare scholar, but I'm an art, I'm a big fan. <laughs> and I really right. feel like I have, I have stuff to impart about him. I love doing it. Love, love, love it. Do you have a technique for teaching your students acting or is it based upon what the individual students need? I think that um, when I'm teaching uh, Chekhov and any of my contemporary stuff for camera acting, um, I, I pretty much talk in very loose version of the Stanislavski system. It's what I learned at Yale. It was what was taught to us by Earl Gister. And then, um, you know, in our first year. And, and I think that, that it's, but it's, again, it's a sort of a gentle kind of version. What is your action? What are you trying to do to the other actor? What is the obstacle you have to overcome? Um, and then I think when it comes to Shakespeare, I use that to a certain degree, but I also was very influenced by a couple of um, workshops I did with John Barton from the Royal Shakespeare Company. We did, and Kevin actually, Kevin and I were in all of them together and uh, an incredible group of actors um, at, the, at the theater, at, um, at the public downtown. And then I also, was blessed to be involved in a, a quite a few workshops with Cecily Barry up at Lincoln Center. So I feel like they really had an enormous influence on me in sort of strate strategy, strategic technique on how to approach Shakespearean text. Now, in, in a way, what you're doing has an echo of your father because you, you do classical theater and you're a dedicated Shakespearean performer, mm -hmm. but also you've been in enormously popular television series yes. like Grey's Anatomy and yeah. Scandal, I guess, are the yeah. two that you're most well known for. Those are the ones Shonda, I You mentioned Shonda Rhimes, who's a yeah. marvelous contemporary Shonda writer. Loves... We're not talking about Shakespeare or, no, but, or Chekhov here. But there are many actors in her shows who've done a ton of Shakespeare. And she, particularly with Scandal, she would often give us these staggering speeches. And I noticed that you know, she would often give them, particularly to the actors who had done a ton of theater. And that was pretty much the whole cast. So when Joe Morton, who's now playing King Lear uh, here in LA and I, you know, were being given these like monster things, I was like, dear God, you know, and then I thought, oh yeah, I know how, you know, the train, that's where the training kicks so in. So there's, there's a crossover. Yeah, there's, there's a crossover. Cross there is there's a crossover. Cross Absolutely. But you, you and you enjoy doing television series work and ensemble oh, yeah. work. I enjoy it because it's 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 very finite and it's sort of like it's like you hold it in your hands and then it goes poof. And ironically though, that's the stuff that you do that's there forever. So you know it's the wonderful juxtaposition between the television. I've gotten to play amazing roles. And you know, when I first came out, at, out to LA, which I was I'm now 64, I was 49. And I said to my husband, really, really, you know, I'm gonna, you're, you're making me come to LA and I have no facelift, it's gonna happen. You know, <laughs> I still don't. Um, and the truth of it is that I had started to do Grey's Anatomy about two years before I came to LA. And little did I know that that would become such an interesting role to play it, Ellis Gray and Grey's Anatomy. And that just led me to e so much of the other stuff I've gotten to do. And I've gotten to do mostly drama. I would say mostly one hour drama that's been, but occasionally I've gotten to be in an amazing comedy like Veep. So I got to do Veep and that was just a blessedly amazing experience. But what, what's, what's 
wonderful to hear is you, you tell us your age, you are <laughs> you're the age that you're at, but mm-hmm. at your age, you're getting almost more work than you've ever gotten before. I mean, you work all the time. Yeah, no, COVID was for some peculiar reason, COVID last year, Last year, um, 2020, I was going to say 1921. Nope. Uh, 2021 um, was uh, an incredible robust year for me work-wise with television. I, 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 I mean, to be honest, I couldn't believe it. And I did everything from totally cutie pie little shows for the CW where I played witches and, you know, um, sci-fi characters and then Hillary Clinton, and then, you know, and then I'd already done Inventing Anna for Shonda, um, playing very glamorous lady, which is so fun for me because I don't get to play really glamorous ladies. So that was very fun. And then ended up doing, they've all, they've all been great. But uh, one of the things I loved Inventing Anna, and I also love doing this uh, show called The Dropout, uh, which is on Hulu and is about Elizabeth Holmes and Theranos. And that was an unbelievable experience for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons is I got to work with Stephen Fry, Laurie Metcalf and uh, Bill Macy. So, uh, you know, it's just, I feel like when I'm, when I'm working with these actors who are just so mercurial and amazing, including Viola Davis, you know, I just, um, I feel, gosh, I'm just, I feel so blessed. You know, it really is. That's why we do it is for those moments of connection and if you're if you're blessed to work, and, and I love working with great young actors, you know, who suddenly are making their way. And Julia Garner in Inventing Anna, amazing young actress, amazing young actress. And I mean, I loved working with her. You see among your students, uh, uh, young people who are very talented. And oh my God. Destined for a career. Destined. I mean, listen, one of the first students I ever had when I, I used to sub at Fordham in New York for Marion Seldes. Oh, our beloved (laughs) Marion and Lila Robbins, another great, great actress. And I did a kind of a tag team thing where we both subbed for Marion. And one of my first students was this lovely blonde young woman. And I said to her, she did Masha and Vershina for me. And I, because I would always teach Chekhov to the kids at Fordham. And, uh, and it was remarkable. She was remarkable. And I went, okay. And so I just took her aside and I was like, so um, this is, you're planning to do this, correct? And she said, oh yes. And I said, so what do you want, what's your plan? And she said, well, I would love to apply to MFA program. And I said, great, you know, where do you wanna go? She said, I wanna go to NYU. I said, sounds great. I, you know, I said, I'm happy to help you with your audition. I did, she got in. And then um, she ended up, doing a little television show called Orange is the New Black. And she, her name is Taylor Schilling. And you know, she's still and I, she and I are constantly in touch. We almost played mother and daughter two summers ago at Williamstown before COVID. And you know, I, I, you know, I, I, I was thrilled because I, I saw it in her immediately. And I'm just so happy, it's so excited. It's nothing more exciting than when you're like, that's, the, that's a tremendously exciting thing as a teacher. But the other thing is when your student breaks through and you've been working with them and working with them and suddenly all the dots connect and suddenly there they are and they're doing their amazing work. And, you know, it's it's thrilling as a teacher. I love it. Sort of coming full circle now, going back to the beginning, you worked with your father in one of his last two performances. I did two things. With him I, did, twice. I did Alice in Wonderland with him on PBS uh, where he was the white knight and I was reprising my role uh, as Miss Alice. And it was an incredible experience doing that with him. I'm so thrilled that scene, it's the sweetest scene in the world between the two of us. And, you know, in that, and talk about slice of life, talk about time capsule, it's Colleen Dewhurst, Maureen Stapleton, Jimmy Coco, young Nathan Lane, uh, Austin Pendleton, Eve Arden, Kay Ballard. I mean, it oh is, goodness. it's yeah. its a panoply of the great sort of middle-aged actors of that time. And I worked with all of them. I worked with all of them. And it was just, th- and I'd worked with Colleen. I worked with Colleen like three times. So that was so thrilling. And then Data and I did, um, right before he died in 1984, we did a 
funny little mini series called Ellis Island. And he really, I mean, he really put me in front of the camera, both tape, which was PBS, great performances, and then film camera, which was, you know, for, for a mini series, remember for mini series? We used to do lots of mini series. And, um, and that was, he put me in front of the camera. I mean, he got me going and he told me things and everything was helpful and I'll never forget them. So he did finally accept your desire to be in the profession. Yeah, well, he did. And the hilarious thing is, you know, I went to Yale. He was pretty thrilled about Yale, I gotta be honest. Yeah. He's like, yes, it's Yale. Yale is great. I'm like, yeah, Yale yeah, is great. I said, oh my God. Yeah. Did you not know that? Okay. Uh, <laughs> so I went to Yale. And then when I came out and I immediately went to, got my first job right out of school, he was, he said, I called him backstage. No cell phones then actor phone, called him backstage. And I said, hi dad. Um, so I'm at the Circle in the Square Theater. I'm doing a play by your friend, Noel Coward with George C. Scott. And you know, I don't, I like, I didn't tell him. I, I hadn't told him clearly. And he, went, and he said, are you telling me the truth? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm lying. And you're gonna come to the theater and it's gonna be some other girl. Yeah, I'm telling you the truth. He was like, well, that's remarkable. So he came to the show and to be honest, um, I think he liked it. I think he was like a nervous, I mean, I know he was a nervous wreck because I could see him. I could see him I, in the I'm audience. Nervous, like, on, your oh, nervous on your behalf. Nervous on your behalf. Yes, he was so nervous. And then, but I know the thing that really, I mean, he, he, he thought George was hilarious. He loved it and he enjoyed the play. But I think where he really felt like, oh, she can do this <clears throat> is when I did, um, Winners by Brian Friel, the Irish play. For him, I, I knew I could see, he was like, oh, okay. And that was, and that really was for me, like I think where everybody realized like, oh, I'm an actor, you know, I, I'm actually can act, you know. It's you, for me you, too, it's for me too. I, I, am I correct, you do work still for Elizabeth Taylor AIDS Foundation? Oh yeah, I'm an ambassador. Uh, my 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 major charity is is AIDS research and education always has been um, before even before Elizabeth created the foundation. But, so I'm an ambassador. But, her, but her she was courageous at the time. And Unbelievable in what she did. She was amazingly yeah. courageous. When she passed away 11 years ago, it was the most incredible thing. Around all of LA were these huge banners, these huge posters, these huge billboards saying, Elizabeth Taylor, our champion, gay men's health crisis. And you know, what she did for AIDS research, AIDS education, AIDS funding. Awareness, AIDS awareness, and AIDS just awareness. acknowledging it. Acknowledging yeah, it. Because of Rock Hudson. Rock Hudson was her friend. And, and I'm also on the board of Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS. So, and I've been on that board for I love that board, it's, I swear to God, it's like my favorite place on earth. And those guys are the best, Tom Viola. And then, you know, we, we cross pollinate with soon to be renamed Actors Fund so much. And so Joe Ben and Casa is there. I mean, it's just, it's the most, I love it whenever I'm doing a show and we can do the AIDS, you know, reach out at the end, we can, you know, the, I mean, $4 million have been raised this year on Broadway. But, but I know at the end, uh, Elizabeth Taylor said that she really wanted to be remembered most for her philanthropic work and her yes. AIDS contribution. Yeah, yeah, she did, she did. And um, and she did, and she was. And, um, but her, you know, her belongings, um, there was an incredible auction that happened. It was a worldwide event, actually, and all her <laughs> caftans, oh my God, it made me laugh. But, uh, you know, 20 caftans. And then all her amazing jewels, um, everything, uh, all, the, all, the, all the profits from that created the Elizabeth Taylor AIDS Foundation. So that, you know, it's just an incredible legacy. And you yeah, know, and in, in, with, with Broadway Cares, you know, one of the, we have so many great legacies, but one of the greatest legacies we have is Fred, the Fred Ebb Foundation that every year, I mean, millions upon millions of dollars come towards Broadway Cares. It's just, it just makes your heart sing. It just is incredible. Yeah, but, but for Elizabeth, the, beneath the glamor and the incredible 
beauty. A friend of mine who knew her said, when you saw her, her beauty simply took your breath away. Oh, yeah. <laughs> beneath, really so. beneath that beauty and glamour and celebrity, yeah. there was a very good and warm hearted person. Oh, no, she was she was, you know, she grew up in. Incre- I mean, any of these folks, any of these children who be, were child stars in Hollywood and what they experienced as child stars. And, you know, you've heard all the stories. Um, she was a survivor. I mean, she was a survivor. She lived until she was 79. I mean, it's really remarkable. Um, and, you know, the fact is, is that when she found her calling, um, it was, an, first of all, it was an incredible thing, obviously for anybody dealing with AIDS, as so many of our friends, you know, were and you know, still are. Um, but the fact that the, the foundation lives on and that, you know, she was, she's so, and her, her 10 grandchildren are huge ambassadors for um, ETAF. And we have gone together to Washington um, to lobby, which was the first time I'd ever done that in my life. And, you know, all of us, Elizabeth's 10 grandchildren and me, their aunt, Aunt Kate, sitting in, you know, imagine if you will, us sitting in Jeff Sessions office. <laughs> it was like, I was like, okay, everybody, this is an out of body experience. <laughs> we will get through it. But you know, it was, um, it was an incredible thing. It was, it, it continues to be an incredible thing. Yeah. You know, it's been fascinating talking to you. It's been I such a pleasure. I've your... seen some friends on the gallery. So Hey, I, I look forward to your book. You have a story to tell. We we'll all see. want to hear it. We <laughs> all want to hear it. Magda, are there questions from the house? Yes. Anybody have questions? Just, just um, you, you raise chat. your hand, and uh, we'll uh, and uh, we'll get you uh, unmuted. Yeah, there's, no, there's nothing in the chat. So oh, well, oh, I have a quick question. Liz Hubble had something to ask. Mm. Uh, oh yes. Okay. Yes, and and you. We have a hand up. <laughs> That's me, Bonnie. Hi, Hi I have Bonnie. a quick question. Sure. Um, you mentioned that you grew up as a child in New York City. Mm-hmm. So um, so did my son. And I'm a little curious where you went to elementary school and high school. I went to high school. I graduated from the United Nations International School. Unit. Oh, you mentioned that. I went yeah. to UNIS. So I was there from eighth grade to 12th grade. And then before that, I went to a school that no longer exists, which was originally called École Française and then became Fleming. And the reason why my parents put me there, my mother, was because I grew up in French Switzerland and she thought that I would be comfortable in a sort of a French speaking school, but, but it wasn't fully, it wasn't like Lycée Français, which is completely, everything's in French. And I would have not, that would have not been a great school for me, Lycée Français. So, um, so this was, it was a good school. It was tiny, me and Amanda Plummer, we both went there together. Uh, we totally grew up side by side and then, um, and then in the eighth grade, I then shifted to the United Nations School, which was a progressive school. <laughs> Thank Go you. Ahead. Yes, Jim, did you want to speak, Jim? Unmute Jim Brochu. Hello. Oh, hi, Jim. Hello, my darling Kate. How are you? It's been a long time. I know. Do you miss our afternoon swims? <laughs> yes, I do. Really I know. When right. will we get in that pool again? Oh, soon, I hope. But listen, yeah. how's, how's Michael? He's well. He's in New York City as we speak. Okay. When you get here, I want you to come over for coffee, all right? I want to you catch up. You got it. I love you. Love you too, honey. So Goodbye. happy to see you. All right, uh, Liz Hubble, would you go ahead and unmute yourself, ask your question? Yeah, sure. I'm unmuted. Um, this is actually a question from my husband who's sitting here sort of out of camera range uh-huh. uh, about acting technique. Can you speak mm-hmm. to anything specific that you know you learned from any of your four parents? <laughs> uh, four. Either, or how many? What? No, I guess, yes, four. You're right. <laughs> uh, any of your parents, either by osmosis or direct demonstration? Um, you know, that's a great question, Liz. I actually did. One of the things I particularly learned from my father, part of it was something I observed, but also my mother had pointed out um, that my father had incredible stillness on stage. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one of the reasons he did actually, funnily enough, was more of a strategic um, plan because, excuse me, because he was very awkward moving. He didn't have any kind of movement training. He didn't have, you know, he wasn't a dancer, God knows. And if you ever want to know if my father was a dancer, 
just watch him and Julie Andrews on the Ed Sullivan show dancing around, it's hilarious. I mean, she is of course, <laughs> He's like a complete wreck, but anyway, it's adorable. Um, and I think that is the biggest, the stillness. And also my dad said to me when we were shooting Ellis Island, he said, I, I, I had not uh, slept very well the night before and I was nervous, obviously, I wonder why. And um, he said, don't, and I was trying to overcome the fact that I was tired. And he said, no, no, use your fatigue. He said, let, your, let you are where you are as an actor. And later on, I remember hearing Mike Nichols saying to Glenn Close one time after a real thing, saying, bring your day on with you. And I must say that's something I've always experienced as an actor, especially in the eight show a week format, which is really grueling, um, is just don't try to force it, let it emerge. And really that's, you know, that's what we talk about to our students, breathing, be in the moment, let the words come out, organically, naturally, what are you trying to say to the other person? So I do think that that's something that dad was imparting to me very early on. Um, my, because I actually grew up with a working actor, which was my stepfather, Jordan Christopher. And so I could see the way he, you know, kind of went about his life, his auditions, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, I think the greatest thing about all three of my actor parents is nobody took themselves too seriously. And I think that it was, it, there was a fun aspect to it. There was a silly aspect to it. And I think that that was good because I think that people, it, I truly believe when I look at, at folks who just take themselves so darn seriously, I'm like, oh my God, really? I mean, you do know that you've chosen to be an actor. You know, this is not exactly, we're, we're not curing cancer. I wish we were, you know, so yeah. Thanks a lot. Okay. You're welcome. Thanks, Liz. I've got two questions from Ted Whipple. Yes. Uh, first question is, any thoughts about the changes in theater versus home viewing and the popularity of the Siri multi-season multi format? We'll do that one first. Yeah. Well, the serial uh, multi-season format is something that I've spent a lot of time. Uh, and when you're talking about, you're talking about like, like a series, like Grey's Anatomy or, you know, Scandal or something like that. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious about that. I actually think um, that is great and I love doing it, but I've also really loved these limited series that I've been doing. Um, last year I did Inventing Anna, The Dropout, and now I'm on one that just came on called Bosch Legacy. And I really, but that is actually, that will go on. The dropout in Inventing Anna will not go on. Um, so I, I find that a very, it's an interesting thing for actors because you get to tell the story in nine episodes, 10 episodes, and then you're done. And I think a lot of actors really love that because they can really get something, you know, chew the scenery. <laughs> uh, they, they can really find something to, to, to work on there. So that's, I've really enjoyed that as an actor myself. And in terms of the theater versus home viewing, you know, who are we kidding? I mean, there's nothing like live theater. And, you know, I do know when I first went back into a theater on stage, I honestly could tell you that the audiences were like, oh, oh my God, you know, it's happening. You know, you're actually doing a play for me and your masks are off. And it was, I hope, and you know, I've been hearing about the death of theater since I graduated from Yale 40 years ago. And guess what? It's still kicking. So, you know, I think there's nothing that can replace that. Having said that, I was horrified when um, they taped Present Laughter um, five years ago with Kevin Klein, And I was like, oh God, this will be so awful. And you know what, during COVID and it came on one night and I lay there on my bed and just chuckled away and watched it. And I just thought, thank God it existed. So many people got to see it. And so many people didn't have to spend a hundred and whatever dollars, $200 to see it. They could see it in their house. They could be drinking a glass of wine and watching one of the greatest comic actors of our time, Kevin Klein, do that performance, which was a comic genius, you know? Um, and, you know, I'm just so happy for my grandkids, you know, that those things exist so that they can, people say, oh, I saw President Laughter the other night, like, like, you know, last week. And I go, oh my God, you know, and it's just, I'm glad it exists. But personally, I would always love to see something in, in the flesh, in, in live theater. 
Uh, I think he he was referring to the difference between going to a movie house as opposed to home. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, yeah, movies. Yeah, I I like going to a movie house. I really do. Um, um, and in fact, uh, Frances McDormand being one of my great pals, I've always been always tried to see her shows in the movie, her, her movies in the movie theater. I couldn't do it with Nomadland. And I finally resorted to watching it on my computer, which depressed me. But once it got started, I was fine. So again, you know, this extraordinary content, these amazing stories. And, you know, I'm about to go to Mexico City and do a job. I've never seen Roma, shockingly, the incredible movie that won all the Oscars. And now, you know, I can watch it. I can watch it on my computer. I can get, you know, uh, I've never seen the show that I'm doing even though I was in the first season. So now I'll get to watch the show. It's called Mosquito Coast. <laughs> uh, I think Catherine, you have a question. Catherine, one of the great jazz singers would like to ask your question. Catherine Russell, take it away. Unmute yourself, Catherine. Oh, okay. <laughs> Can you hear me? Hey, Catherine, yes, oh, hi, how are oh, you? I know I'm, you, how are okay. you? <laughs> Good, great, this is so wonderful listening to you speak. Oh, thank um, you. So my question was, you know, actors have roles that they uh you know have longed to play for many years and i just wondered uh what would you like to you know what role would you like to play when you return to the new york stage oh, oh does that sound glamorous <laughs> uh when i return to the new york stage um you know it's funny as as a you know one of the things that i've that I've had, I've been very blessed to play many great leading roles, but mostly I would say most happily, I would say in the last like 25 years. Before that, whenever I was cast in a leading role, I'd be like, oh, uh, too much responsibility. Uh, and I kind of feel that way a little bit now, like too much responsibility. Like when I did Christmas Carol with Bradley Whitford and he was Scrooge and I'd be like, having a good time, see you later. You know, I'd come on and I have my three fabulous scenes of the ghost of Christmas past. And then I'd be like, off to my dressing room. And he was like, you know, told me to F off, you know. Uh, anyway, um, you know, there's, I've always, I guess it's sort of obvious, but, um, you know, Mary Tyrone, you know, Mary Tyrone has always been in Long Day's Journey and Tonight. I have to, I, it's a play I want to do with my son. And we've sort of, me and Reed Bernie and my son and his son, have talked about figuring out a way to do it, but actually maybe not in New York, maybe like in England. Um, so again, but like, I'd love to do it where I wouldn't have to do it eight shows a week because it's such a brutally hard role. Um, my stamina is not what it was. Um, but in terms of like the part, you know, playing wonderful supporting roles, I love doing those. And um, so we'll see, um, there's a couple of Shakespeare older roles, male roles I actually have my eye on. Um, I did tell the wonderful trans actor, Asia Kate Dillon, that if they ever did Hamlet, I would please like to play their mother. So um, I have put that out there. Um, so, you know, there's things, there's a little Shakespeare here, the King John, I mean, um, uh, Henry IV part one, I would love to play Henry IV. Um, certain things, but again, I would want to be, you know, I love the public theater. I love Lincoln Center, love Manhattan Theater Club. I love those sort of lengths of runs. So I think something like that. I do have a possible show that I may do um, in two, the summer, a summer from now. And I am contemplating it hugely because it is a gigantic role. It would be not, not in New York City, but it would be close by. And so, you know, and the biggest thing for me is, will I have fun? Like if I'm gonna be taking a monster role and I'm gonna be like, you know, you know, heaving in the wings, is that a good thing? Or do I wanna play something where I can just enjoy myself a little bit? So, you know, we'll see what happens, but I'm thinking about a few things. Thank you. You're welcome, Thank Catherine, great question. Ted Whipple asks, um, if you were in Puerta Vallarta during the filming of The Night of the Iguana, yeah. and if so, do you have any recollections? I never was there during that. In fact, I didn't go to Puerto Vallarta until way after that. But Puerto Vallarta was the love of my father's life. I mean, he loved Puerto Vallarta. It was a place that he, it was his most favorite place. He relaxed there. He just loved 
the people, the climate. It just was a place that he could really, you know, and my dad loved to write. And, you know, we only know this because of his amazing diaries, which are great because what's so great about those diaries, I was just talking about them earlier today, is they're really him. But I was not around uh, Night of the Iguana. I actually um, knew I, that was not a movie that, the only movies that I was really around for um, that I was like on the set were the ones I've mentioned, um, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf and um, Anne of the Thousand Days. And then I was also around for some of the really trash movies that dad did in the eighties and, or no, the seventies, I'm sorry, the later seventies. Um, and, uh, and I was around sort of, um, I was never around during Beckett, VIPs, none of those. So not around at all during a spy on camera from the cold. So yeah, so, so I, you know, I was only on set. For, oh, I know he played a Marshall Tito in a movie about uh, Yugoslavia. <laughs> so I was around for that. That was fun. But yeah, so, you know, it was, it was, uh, I didn't get to hang out on that set, but he loved it. So with that, Foster, we'll pass it back to you. Okay, wonderful to to spend this time with you, Kate. You're a natural storyteller. I wonder where you get that from. Do you have, do you have a, a, a summer play engagement lined up for, no, for this summer? No, no, no plays this summer. My whole thing is I do a play a year. And so I kind of, because Christmas Carol, we almost made it to the new year, uh, but Christmas Carol uh, started last October. I did it October, November, half of December, and then COVID closed, closed us down, which was a little sad. Um, but no theater, through this summer for sure that I know that I know of, but almost certainly none. I'm gonna uh, shoot uh, Mosquito Coast uh, the month of June in hot Mexico City. And then I'm gonna make my way across the United States in my Volvo with my dog, uh, with my husband and my dog. And we're gonna make our way to New York City. And you know, there might be some theatrical something next year, but nothing that I really know about. The, the only thing that I know that I've been offered is this fabled and what about teaching, teaching at USC? Oh yeah, that'll continue. I'm gonna do it remotely in the fall from New York. I'm gonna teach um, camera classes remotely, which frankly on Zoom is a no brainer. It's so easy. And frankly, this is all they need to know. Um, and then I'll go on the ground like three or four times in the semester, I'll come out to LA and I'll bounce around. And then the spring right now, I'm planning to park it in LA uh, to be on, the, I'm trying to see if that's a, a model that can work for me half, half a year actually in LA. And we'll see, we'll see. And it may not, but I have some thoughts about other places, but I think for now, I'm just gonna sort of see how it works out. Okay. Well, okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Kate Burton, it's Kate, been a pleasure. Yeah, Kate, thank you so much. You're, you're, you're welcome, wonderful. Foster. And I would love to read your father's diary. You know, they're pretty great. Uh, they're okay. long. I think they're long. Maybe, oh, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, but they're, but maybe but they're, someday but you can publish it. Thanks, Magda. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. They're they're oh, public. No. They're long. Oh, public. oh yeah, yeah. You yeah, know, you'll see okay. them. Well, we'll, look, we'll look forward to your book then. Thank okay. you. Yes, hopefully, hopefully, I'll be able to yeah, figure that out. We'd love to have you, uh, Mark. We, we'd love to have you. Say when you when you get to New York with the dog, I notice how you say I the love the land. Husband, but come visit the land. I've been ha I've spent many happy times at your wonderful well, establishment. That that that's, uh, that the Forty Fourth Street Theater is not the Lambs. Right. Oh, I know that. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was told that actually when I was yeah. there. Yeah. And we have, oh, we have that identity problem. Now there's a restaurant that. Jeff yes, I know. For, so we're I know. saying, this is who we are. But uh, on behalf of everybody, thanks so much for doing this. It was delightful. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Kate. And hello to Louise and Betty. I saw you were there. So thanks. Thanks guys. Have a beautiful, beautiful rest of your week. You too. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.